Hello, everybody, wherever you are in the world. I am. My name is Zoe Shuttleworth, and I'm. I live in Western Australia. Thanks for coming and joining me for this meeting about Taurus season. It's an amazing, another amazing month ahead, and um, yeah, we can look at some of what's going on. Um, through the lens of a sort of um, evolutionary astrological perspective, as well as some Jungian sort of thoughts and um, mythological kind of views as well. <clears throat> this um, beautiful image is by Kier Leonis, if that's how you pronounce it. Um, yeah, he did a whole range of um, the zodiac. They're very beautiful. Okay, let's begin. So, um, with regards to where we're at, we sort of need to be oriented to where we've been and where we're coming from. So, of course, the Pluto Jupiter conjunction of um, early April, um, which we're still sort of in the midst of currently, um, though they're separating, certainly still within orb. Um, and of course, earlier in the year, um, mid-January, we had the Pluto-Saturn series conjunction, um, which is, uh, yeah, the obviously the talk of the town, what everyone's been talking about, and um, much has been said about that in the, over many years. Um, in terms of what that means for us all. And of course, we're living through it and experiencing it as we speak. So yeah, it's amazing times and we are certainly witnessing um, the breakdown of old structures as, as was predicted, although we didn't really see how it would um, manifest. We are certainly seeing it now. Um, the Pluto square Eris, situation which is ongoing um, be beginning with its exact last year and continuing through to 2021 that square is active throughout these years and um certainly beyond that even with a little wider orb so um that for me the pluto square eris uh, feels very much um, like a feminine energy, um, Eris of course being the goddess of discord or strife and Pluto um, can also be imagined in a kind of feminine sense or yin kind of sense um, in that uh, Liz Green has talked about Pluto as being the mora, the fates, um, I like that imagining of it. And, um, but however we imagine Pluto, certainly the energy is about the breaking down and renewal of things. And um, yes, in relation to that square with Eris, it's certainly a, um, an upheaval that we're all experiencing at the moment. Um, I think about the discord in the sense of the um, discomfort that we experience inwardly um, on a personal level um, and sort of taking that as an opportunity to work with those difficult emotions and those edgy parts of ourselves that allow for um, the expansion of soul, if you like, or the growth or change of soul, um, the coming into contact with our complexity and um, increasing multi-dimensionality. Um, I feel like that Eris is a, is a big part of that. And um, we have certainly disinvited discord and disharmony and um, difficult emotions for long enough, I think. I think the path forward is certainly to do with the um, Aries and Aries, which of course we're 
almost 100% of the people on the planet now are born with Eris and Aries, and that continues for a long time yet. So, um, as well as the Neptune in Pisces, which is the age of screens in the palms of our hands, essentially, as well as, of course, the fake news and all of that. Um, but it just, it, it's an incredible thing has happened in the world since Neptune has been in Pisces in that we are all like living with this screen in our hand um, quite often. And that's a big, that's a big change in terms of the collective. Uranus in Taurus um, continues to unfold. Um, to me, that has been most beautifully described by um, Jason Holly as in the, way, the awakening of the Minotaur in Greek mythology and um, what lies beneath our serene surface. So that certainly ties into the themes of Taurus season, um, being that we are now, the sun is in Taurus as of a couple of days ago and tomorrow we will have our um, new moon in Taurus applying to the conjunction with Uranus. So um, being curious to that what lies beneath um, beneath what we sort of show to the world kind of experience. Again, linking into that inner discomfort that we are all probably mostly struggling with at the moment given the situation. Although perhaps we are starting to find a rhythm with that being as we've sort of lived through this Aries season um, but I'll come to that in a minute. Well, I'll come to that now. Chiron in Aries and um, Aries season. For me, Chiron in Aries is very much to do with the limitations of our ego consciousness um, and the idea that we are the dictators of our existence or that we can sort of direct our experience. Um, is That's a kind of a limited view in a way. Um, and getting into, bringing that into our consciousness, our awareness, and um, having that as a, as a lived experience is actually quite a wounding, um, can be experienced quite painfully as we recognise that we don't necessarily get to decide the way that our life's going to go and that the choices that we make require that we sacrifice other things and um, that can be quite painful so anyway that's how I feel about Chiron in Aries and I think that Aries season that has just passed now um, was a lot about that given the you know that everybody has been self-isolating and quarantining and um, that has caused us um, a lot of people quite to become quite distressed even um, and certainly uncomfortable um, and part of that to me I think in a more deep sense than the obvious inconvenience and um, bothersome nature of it in some regards although some people are enjoying it of course and certainly there are wonderful things to come out of it but there is definitely that side of it that is um, difficult and uh, yeah so I also want to mention the asteroid goddesses who to me seem massively important throughout this time and I work with them more and more series of course um, with, with, she's the dwarf planet more than an asteroid of course technically um, and she was part of the conjunction of the Pluto-Saturn um, conjunction in January um, and Gray Crawford wrote an amazing piece about that a few weeks ago, which is well worth visiting his website. And um, of course, Ceres and Pallas Athena throughout this year are in Capricorn Aquarius. Um, Juno has been in Libra all this year, and she was a part of the most recent full moon in Libra. She's retrograde at the moment. Vesta and Hygieia are in Gemini with Venus and are a part of the uh, Venus retrograde and also um, significant in the chart of the transitioning of the lunar nodes as well. And so finally, just to bring us up to speed, the um, Aries season and the Libra full moon, um, for me, brought the 
renewed understanding of how we are all dealing with conflict within our lives in the sense that we are pulled in many different directions. I'd say at least four, and perhaps they point to the cardinal points or the angles within our charts being the ascendant, descendant, IC, MC, you know, it, um, how we want to sort of be crucified in life in the sense of being stretched in all directions and um, the struggle of that though is where the creativity comes from and finding ways to work with that creatively instead of feeling victimised and feeling that we have to um, martyr important parts of who we are to what we might imagine to be the greater good or anything like that. Okay. So the continuing unfoldment of what's going on. The sun ingressed into Taurus on the 19th. All of my times are Australian Western Standard, um, which is probably quite inconvenient for most people, and I'm sorry about that, but it is essentially Greenwich Mean Time plus eight. Um, I didn't want to leave no times, and I didn't want to, I struggled with that, but anyway, so I've gone with my time. Um, so Venus, of course, presides over the sun's journey through Taurus and she is in Gemini at the moment with Vesta and Hygieia. Ceres ingresses Pisces on the 24th of April. Black, the true Black Moon Lilith enters Taurus on the 28th and then retrogrades back to Aries um, before she comes to her conjunction with Mercury and Uranus on the 1st of May. Um, while um, mean Black Moon Lilith is actually in Aries throughout. Um, Pallas Athena enters Aquarius on the 30th of April and in the hours before the lunar nodes transition signs Juno and the moon come together in a conjunction at seven degrees of Libra which is opposite to Chiron and mean black moon Lilith and trine Uranus um, and for me I really like imagining uh, like the moon brings a lot of life a lot of life into my imaginings of things as it sort of activates the various points every month and um, to me this is just like a beautiful image of Juno and Luna coming together to sort of debrief about what's gone on um, perhaps especially since the Libra full moon in which they both they came together last month so um I just wanted to mention that and um, I, yeah perhaps I should say um, Juno being the goddess of the sacred union um, and also the goddess of, she represents like the wife archetypally and um, how we work with that energy in our life in terms of conscious partnership if we happen to be in a relationship and the regeneration of our relationships through the union that, that goes on um, instead of power struggles and that sort of thing. Um, so then the lunar nodes transition to Gemini Sagittarius of course on the 5th of May and Mars will enter Pisces on the 13th of May. So that's some of what we're up for. That's just a basic rundown. The sun in Taurus is about <laughs> many things, resources, skills, money and economy, um, simplicity, self-sufficiency, survival and security, sensuality of course, the bodily senses, um, this is a good reminder to me as well, breath, the body's anchor. The stillness in motion, um, being able to maintain that oh, initially before we maintain it, we have to get in contact with it, that inner peace, that inner stillness that exists within us all, whether we imagine that as being our link to the divine or to spirit, but it is this um, ever present. Um, centre of our being and the breath is certainly a gateway to that. I also like to mention um, Jeffrey Wolf Green talks in um, Pluto Volume 1 about the frog in the well in relation to Pluto in Taurus and how, how our 
perspective and the way that we see life is limited to our experience and that is likened to being the frog in the well in the sense that the frog looks up and sees you know the brick surrounds and the circle of sky at the top and um that is that is the extent of it and we all have that inherently based on our own lot in life and how we are experiencing life is based upon so many variables where we're born and the culture into which we're born and the family to which we come and um, you know our education our socioeconomic status our um, so many things so all of those shape our personal reality and shape the identity that we come to attach ourselves to in the sense of the persona and perhaps the ego and um, I think that the sun in Taurus perhaps never more so than at this time points us to consider our values given that we're being slowed down I know that not everybody is being slowed down my life has not changed very much at all in fact I'm busier if anything because I've got all my children at home um, but many people are being slowed down perhaps against their will and perhaps this gives the opportunity for us all in whatever moments we have you know as we go about our days to examine our values and to look at, at, at the nature of our personal reality and how it's limited and and whether we actually just blindly accept what's what's been given to us or are we able to question it are we able to expand our view of that and venus in gemini is very supportive of that being in curious and open-minded gemini it's very much it's a perfect time to really consider these things so and then of course mercury moving into taurus um, and then the mutual reception between venus in gemini and mercury in taurus further facilitates that process and it's very like it's important to remember that um, those themes, these Taurian themes, are of ongoing significance because Mercury, as the ruler of the North Node, um, is in Taurus at the transition of the lunar nodes. So the Sun, in aspect to um, everything <laughs> this month. Um, so in the last couple of days, the sun was um, in a harmonious aspect to the respective lunar nodes um, and square to Saturn on the 21st, so that was yesterday. Um, the new moon, of course, is tomorrow. And for me, this, this um, lunar cycle will be an awakening to the genius of the here and now. Um, after we have gone through this sort of initiation, we're still in the initiation, of course, of, of the larger um cycles and things that are going on but um as we you know, hone in on the smaller smaller cycles we can certainly see this time as um the awakening of um of what's right here with us in our lives and what we do with that um conjunct uranus the sun will be conjunct uranus on the 26th of april um the conjunction of course being the new instinctive impulse and with Uranus that being quite um, perhaps abrupt or um, perhaps disruptive um, certainly rocking our boat potentially uh, the conjunction with Mercury at 14 Taurus on the 5th of May um, that, that being the Kazemi that new ideas becoming conscious um, then the full moon on the 7th of May being the illumination of our path forward um, to some extent. Um, I think that beyond the full moon, we'll see more and more where we need to go as it sort of unfolds um, under the influences of the sun sextile Neptune on the 10th, where I feel like those days around the full moon and into that uh, sextile will be contemplation is a is a positive activity to engage in um, as we sort of reflect on what especially what sort of 
perhaps was seeded with the conjunction of Neptune and the Sun around the 8th of March. Uh, then the Sun will try and Pluto at 24 Capricorn on the 15th of May, um, bringing insights into the psychological, I've got psychological, psychological um, process unfolding since the Saturn Pluto series and Mercury and Sun conjunction in mid January. Um, that can be a very kind of creative um, time uh, as we sort of really, and especially because then a couple of days later we have the Sun trine Jupiter at 27 Capricorn, really giving that um, expansive kind of for future oriented way forward kind of the creativity that, that as well harkens back to the solar eclipse in Capricorn. So yeah, in December. Um, so yeah, it's it's an incredibly powerful month. There's so much going on. So much of that is relating, of course, to Venus being in Gemini and the retrograde that will uh, begin later this month. So Venus in Gemini is about the connection with others, family and friends, and keeping in touch during these times, even though we are physically um, restrained from perhaps seeing each other so much. Um, some might be a good thing. Um, the mutual sharing and the talk therapy, the keeping in mind that we have one mouth and two ears and therefore twice as much listening as speaking. <laughs> I tell my children <laughs> to no avail. Um, then the mental connections as well on a personal level, not just in relationship, which of course Venus is largely about relationship and perhaps the mental connections are a, um, you know, with, that's obviously in relation to the Gemini archetype, um, but that those mental connections and our neurocircuitry um, are about the relationship we have with life itself in terms of our perceptions and how we are experiencing life and where we go with that in our brains, in our minds. Daniel Siegel is, a, is an amazing, um, I think he's a scientist. Um, the book of his that I'm most familiar with is called um, The Whole Brain Child, but he has written many um, yeah, so he might be an interesting person to look up during this time. Uh, Venus travels with Vesta and Hygieia until late May, so that's a significant part of what's going on. Uh, Vesta, of course, tends to the sacred hearth fire, and Hygieia is the goddess of holistic healing and health, holistic health and healing, um, which for me just points to the importance of tending to what's sacred in our lives in order to maintain or restore health and not and so that sacred fire or can be viewed as the libido um, and the erotic but not necessarily limited it includes but is not limited to sexuality so um, Jung talked about libido as like the life energy um, and I've heard um, Esther Perel the relationship counsellor, therapist, talking about um, the erotic and eros as the same kind of idea, that sacred fire within us, what gets us hot, you know, we want to be engaged with life in a way that we can feel that sacred fire within us is a light. We need to tend to that. And this is a great time to be focused upon doing that. <clears throat> Oh, this is a wordy one. So Venus being in Gemini is in the second um, deacon of Gemini now, which is ruled by Mars, which for me just echoed the importance of the relationship between Venus and Mars at this time. They have been in a trine that never fully completes um, for many months, or for several months, and the conjunction that began this cycle occurred last August at 4 Virgo and actually involved the Sun and Juno as well. Um, the first quarter square occurred late January, Venus in Pisces and Mars in Sagittarius, and there was the waxing trine by a sign in uh, March and um, April continued and continues now. Um, 
than Venus stations retrograde, just as Mars ingresses Pisces, um, and then the Venus retrograde will square Mars at 14 Pisces on the 3rd of June, just before the Venus star point. And I just wanted to mention as well, because it seems for me to tie into the larger themes, Venus and Mars, who can be likened to love and strife, um, united in myth to bear the, their daughter Harmonia. And the asteroid Harmonia, minor asteroid Harmonia, is now in Libra. And um, kind of square to the Capricorn situation. <laughs> Okay, so Mercury at the moment, Mercury is still in Aries and moving very fast, moves um, from Aries to Taurus to Gemini in these four weeks. For me, that spoke so much to bridging the impulse, to the instinct, to the ideas and insights. Um, if we follow the flow of Mercury who wants to keep things moving. So um, this morning, <coughs> Mercury was conjunct... Or, actually all day still now and I didn't actually get to catch so I don't think I would have been able to see them anyway but it was very cloudy here this morning um, but the very tiny um, dark moon in Aries was conjunct to or is conjunct um, Mercury today and again I like to imagine that in the sense that they're sharing their stories gathered since their last time together which was at the Pisces dark moon on the 22nd of March, just ahead of the Aries <coughs> when you moon. So at the closing of the cycle of the year. Um, so then Mercury goes on to conjoin Eris on the 25th of April and square Pluto. Uh, Pluto will by then be stationing. Um, so the square to Pluto happens 12 hours later. Um, Mercury then ingresses Oh, sorry, I'll skip that Jupiter, square Jupiter on the 26th, bringing that friction, the analysis that's required of looking back to um, the conjunction. So look, which of course was the January 13th Jupiter, uh, Jupiter, Pluto, Saturn series. All of that was bound up in, in this um, to which we now come being the crisis of action. Like, what do we do with this? What do we do with this experience that we are living through now? What do we do with this awakened? As you know, we are in the throes of this liminal space transitioning from one way of living, one way of being into another and we don't know what it's going to look like and that's uncomfortable you know and so what do we do with that on a purely personal level how can we work with that energy um, so then Mercury ingresses Taurus under the beams that means that Mercury is invisible um, on the 28th of April and once Mercury is in Taurus, the mutual reception, as I mentioned before, with Venus being in Gemini. Mercury then conjoins Uranus on the 1st of May and then will conjoin uh, yeah, the Sun, of course, the Cassini, so on the 5th of May, followed by the trine to Pluto and then Jupiter, which brings insights and inspirations um, as I said, it's very fast moving. So it, we go from that phase of like the crisis in action and what do we do with this to, to some kind of release in the sense that um, we maybe have an inspiration of something to do with, with this energy and what we, what we can do with our given limitations at the moment in a creative sense. <clears throat> Mercury then squares Mars at 28 Aquarius and will then ingress Gemini, still under the beams on the, 20, on the 12th of May. Um, and it's um, a lovely image again, Mercury ascending, <coughs> excuse me, Mercury ascending as an evening star and Venus descending, both being visible just ahead of the 
departure of the sun from Taurus on the 19th and 20th of um, May. So that could be a beautiful sight. Um, we can look forward to if we happen to have visibility in our skies. So here's the chart for the Taurus new moon tomorrow. Uh, it's, an, it's a zero degrees, zero Aries chart. Um, it still has the ascending and midheaven there, which I'm sorry about. It's a little confusing perhaps, but um, the, the angles are set to my location uh, in Western Australia. So, um, but nevertheless, we have the sun and moon at three degrees of Taurus, um, applying to conjoin with Uranus. Uh, in a and separating from the square to Saturn in Aquarius and um, also harmoniously um, linked to the nodes who are in their final degree there of um, Cancer Capricorn. So um, as well, the ruler of the lunation being Venus is at 15 degrees of Gemini and applying to try and Mars still, which never completes, as I mentioned. Um, and I also wanted to point to, I'm not going to talk a great deal about the lunations in the sense of what, what they mean. I'll mention a couple of things, but because there's so much content available online, so many wise people offering so much great information um i don't need to add to the time it takes to get through my own content here today which is like an overview so i just want to bring our awareness to the pertinent points so um i did want, want to mention though that the taurus full moon um, in terms of the larger cycles or intermediate kind of cycles um in October of this year is conjunct Uranus at eight degrees of Taurus. So um, this is like the beginning of that cycle, you know, the cycle that will come to culmination um, in October in Scorpio season. So um, it's just, it's nice to work with the new moons and full moons in this way, I think, because we sort of can pay attention to what we're seeding now and if we can journal or do something creative, um, some kind of honouring ritual ceremony, something to sort of bring our focus into um, what this moment in time is. Um, and it is a sacred time, you know, like Vesta's involvement in all of this is no, no accident and it's certainly not a trivial piece, I don't feel. It's very much about her, her presence here is a reminder to us that we need to give our full focus to life as we know it in all its limitation, in all its difficulty. This is the sacred moment of now. And that's Taurus, isn't it? That, that kind of... Um, experience so but yeah I mean then we as we honor this moment then when we come to that moment the Taurus full moon in October we can look back on this moment and see what ha was seeded here in our you know consciousness that we bring to this moment and our unconsciousness um, what is born from this moment that we then come to see illuminated in October. That may not be news to anybody, but I just wanted to point to it because for me it's a pretty powerful kind of um, ritual and um, cycle kind of thing to observe. Um, so, And then the waxing crescent Gemini moon on the 26th of April, in a few days' time, once we can actually visualise the crescent new moon, um, will be conjunct Venus at her maximum brightness and the invisible asteroids, of course, Vesta and Hygieia are also there. And I think that's what I was just speaking about too, um, is to do with that 
tending to our sacred moments in our life in order that we can experience this um, holistic kind of health because tending to our own sacred fire certainly brings us a sense of vitality that is so important to our holistic health and healing. Okay, so now we go on to the retrogrades and so many retrogrades begin this season. Um, the first is Pluto on the 26th of April at almost 25 degrees of Capricorn. Um, now, I hope we have time. I just want to, if you'll indulge me, this small digression. I had an experience a few weeks ago where I, I gave a Zoom, I had a Zoom meeting for friends who don't know much astrology to talk about the times um, that we're living through and um, from an astrological point of view, but without using the astrological language and terminology. Um, as I sat down to begin that meeting, I noticed that there was a spider to my right here, um, just a little garden spider. They have a, like a beautiful pattern on their on their um, back on their body, um, their abdomen. Do you call it? I, <laughs> so she was seated seated right here beside me um, as I gave this meeting and talked to a group of friends, um, uh, and then I forgot about her foolishly and didn't put her outside or anything. Then a few days later, I woke up in the middle of the night in pitch black and I had a spider in my hand. And at that moment, I had still forgotten about my friend spider here that evening and um, just threw it because I had my two-year-old son in the bed with me and I instinctively screamed through the spider at the window and... Um, turned on the light, he woke up screaming because I had screamed. I got up to see what the spider was because I thought it was a, a poisonous spider that we have in our area, like a white tip. Um, turns out it was the garden spider. I instantly recognised her when I saw her that it was the same spider and she was unharmed, she was fine. Um, and I took her and carried her out into our backyard and everything was good then in the morning when I reflected back on it and remember and so that of course led me into thinking about um, grandmother spider in the Native American traditions um, and the web of the world and the weaving of the web and the, um, grandma the old woman in the cave weaving weaving the world all of those kinds of images came to me and of course the story of Arachne who is linked in myth to Pallas Athena after she foolishly, perhaps, um, audaciously claimed to be a better weaver than Athena. Athena came to view the you know, gift that Arachne had been bestowed with and um, in the end, Arachne was turned into a spider, and um, which was a merciful act by Athena. But of course, Pallas Athena, the asteroid, is so um, important during these times as well, having been in Capricorn um, all year, basically. And um, the and Arachne, it turns out, is a minor asteroid that and she is currently at 24 degrees cancer. So the morning, uh, you know, when I was reflecting on this spider encounter that I had, um, Arachne, the asteroid, was applying to my son, and um, I have a 20 degree cancer son, and so I was <laughs> flabbergasted, kind of, you know, just humbled, awed, very reverent to the experience that I'd had, and so then, of course, that twig made me twig to what's happening in in the broader scheme of things in that Pluto station's retrograde opposite Arachne on the 26th of April. And then um, so do Jupiter um, opposite Arachne again at 27 degrees of Capricorn. And Pallas Athena, she is by then, she retrogrades in Aquarius. Um, and Arachne by then is in Leo and opposite to Pallas Athena on the 18th of May. So. I just feel like that's 
you're probably not going to hear that anywhere else. I felt like it was important for me to share it given my experience um, and that it really brought my awareness to the threads that we have in our lives, the things that we experience. For me, it was this spider encounter that led me to the thread of Arachne that allowed me to share that with you today. And that my life is rich because of having these various threads to pull upon each day and they come to me through astrology of course and through the myth and the stories linked to astrology and um, the amazing you know just incidences in nature where we have encounters with different animals or birds or situations like that or you know like a shooting star or you know whatever it is we have these moments that twig things for us and if we can I feel like this time is so important for indulging that a little bit if we can or where we can to the extent that we are able a dream as well dreams are so potent and lately I've been having amazing dreams that have felt very um like collective kind of and I've heard Jungians talking about that too recently that people seem to be coming into analysis with dreams that are very collectively oriented, um, not just relevant, not only to the personal, but also to um, the, the larger, to us all. Okay. Um, oh, I, oh, I skipped over. Venus, of course, turns retrograde on the 13th of May um, from 21 degrees of Gemini and, um, and Saturn. I miss Saturn. How could I? Um, Saturn turns retrograde on the 11th of May at almost two degrees of Aquarius to return to Capricorn for one final hurrah. If you can call it that with Saturn, not really. Um, okay, so I, I should probably just hone in on that a little bit. I mean, there's plenty to talk about with that and because that will be going ongoing until the end of September, um, Saturn's return into Capricorn um, will not make contact with Pluto again exactly, but certainly within Orb and Jupiter, of course, um, Jupiter and Saturn will return to Aquarius together at the solstice in December. So um, they will, of course, link up um yeah so it's it's more of that like um not more of the same more of an a com complex complexification is that a word um of what we're seeing at the moment where you know we increase our perhaps our understanding through the time you know the retrogrades um, indicate a time of it's not so simple necessarily as revisiting things or redoing things although that can be a significant part of it but it's certainly that <clears throat> that different kind of consciousness is involved in the retrogrades um, in the sense that we look at life a little differently and uh, of course it can um, involve a degree of um, like disappointment or um, frustration. I'm perhaps speaking particularly to the Mars retrograde coming later in the year there, but um, we can certainly experience things going on the back burner um, with, with the retrogrades, depending on how they affect different parts of our own charts. Um, but in terms of what we'll see with the coronavirus and that sort of thing, it'll be interesting to observe what actually unfolds um, with that in relation to the retrogrades and how it will, how it will um, develop going forward. Um, so I guess it's just a, a wait and see kind of thing. How are we going for time? I've got to hurry up. Okay, um, the lunar nodes, um, ingress, or transition into Gemini Sagittarius on the 5th of May, just a few days away now. So we're just, we're just finishing up that Cancer Capricorn lunar node cycle that's been so rich. Um, 
and the lunar nodes will remain Gemini Sagittarius until January 2020. So the ruler of the Gemini North Node is, of course, Mercury. Mercury is halfway through Taurus and conjunct the Sun um, at the ingress, at the transition. So um, that's an important point to make about this, um, this coming um, phase. So Mercury and the Sun actually travel together for almost 24 hours in the same degree, so from um, 14 to 15 degrees of um, Taurus, they are together on, around that day, the 5th of May. Jupiter, the ruler of, Sag of the Sagittarius South Node, is at 27 Capricorn and remains conjunct Pluto. By this stage, Pluto is retrograde at 24 <clears throat> denoting the significance of the Jupiter-Pluto conjunction throughout this time and beyond, of course, because that's a larger cycle that we're talking about. But um, in relation to the lunar nodes in Gemini Sagittarius, Pluto is a significant player as well. Um, and the breaking down, so this for me leads to thinking about the breaking down of the conditioned belief structures um, and what Jupiter, oh, pardon me, Gemini, um, Mercury bring to this is the open-minded accrual of information and wide experiences helping to rewire these um, our own neurocircuitries to um, really open our minds a bit more to <coughs> what's possible and perhaps not being so rigid in terms of our frog in the well sort of perspective um, not limiting ourselves too much because we have enough limitations. We sort of um, we sort of push against the limitations that we have foisted upon us in the sense of our lot in life, and then we um, argue for our limitations in other senses. It's it's a kind of a weird human condition thing, which is so interesting and rich actually because it's all part of the our. Um, I I feel like it's to do with this. Um, back and forth um, dynamic of of polarities and like the Gemini Sagittarius axis or any axis within the zodiac um, to do with the acceptance resistance kind of um, dance I guess okay and um, of course just mentioning Arachne again who will be at 26 degrees of Cancer as the nodes enter Gemini Sagittarius and weaving with those meaningful threads in our lives as a significant part of our evolutionary journeys. Um, an important point to note is that the south node on its ingress into Sagittarius will activate the point of the Saturn-Uranus conjunction that occurred in 88. Um, so that is of course a an important part of what's going on for us all currently as um, when Saturn returns to Aquarius with Jupiter and the Saturn Uranus square, the waning square will occur uh, in January of 2021 for the first time, um, though that's ongoing throughout 2021, the first exact contact waning square crisis in consciousness uh, occurs at, um, in January. So um, perhaps reflecting upon that, um, what's occurred for us since that conjunction in 1988, in terms of the collective, it's quite interesting because it's sort of, um, well, history is not my strong suit, but it's, um, you know, to do with like the Cold War and things like that. Um, and the the power held by America, like the US, and um, yeah, perhaps as um, we get closer and closer to the US Pluto return, we'll be seeing more things eventuate, of course. Another interesting point, um, my distraction with the minor asteroids that has really come on in the last few months especially. Um, so the minor asteroid Hybris, um, I can't even read my own quote there and I knew I should have, let me see if I, I look I can read that. Um, so this quote comes from the wonderful book The Astrology of Fate by Liz Green. Um, the core of Greek tragedy is the dilemma of hubris, which is both man's great gift and his great crime. For in pitting himself against his fated limits, he acts out an heroic destiny. 
Yet by the very nature of this heroic attempt, he is doomed by the ironies to retribution, which is so the human <laughs> condition. <laughs> Uh, and a struggle, you know. Oops, I go back. Sorry. Oh, no, no, yeah, that's right. Um, so that's food for thought. Of course, hubris can be looked at um, more generally as like an arrogance um, and a a bit like arachne. Um, if we dare to defy the gods or um, the limitations foisted upon us or um, railing against our lot. However, we want to look at it, um, yeah, the south node in Sagittarius making that contact with the with Hybris is certainly to me points to the relevance of that in terms of perhaps our karmic situation and what we need to be looking at because I don't feel like the nodes are as simple as the past versus future or like. Um, something we don't necessarily just it's not as simple as moving away from the south node in the direction of the north node but what can we bring through the south node that benefits us in our in our expansion in our self-knowledge um, so the north node in Gemini applies to conjoin the minor asteroid chaos <laughs> which is exact in August at 27 degrees so um, that is another interesting point i wanted to just bring it up in relation to the, the in contrast to this idea of order and consciousness and perhaps like we could look at it as daytime consciousness um, and the ego and that sort of thing chaos um, in contrast pertains to disorder and the unconscious and to me the proximity of the north node to chaos suggests a movement towards that as a potential source of healing and creativity and not only that but the guidance that we can we can actually trust in the unconscious um, as the source of so much richness of our lives and um that's yeah that's food for thought i think um, perhaps we'll do some writing or another talk at some point about that um, yeah this quote is one perhaps my favorite certainly one of my favorites from Rilke, Rilke, Rilke <laughs> excuse my in eloquence um take your well di disciplined strengths and stretch them between two opposing poles because inside human beings is where God learns um, to me that is so rich and so much to do with the that experience that I mentioned a few minutes ago um, being the the dynamism in the conflict um, of the opposing poles the acceptance resistance the you know um, yin and yang you know all of those polarities the, the blacks and whites of life um, here is a chart for the Scorpio full moon. Linda, am I okay for time? Yes, how much do you need? Um, well, I've got how many? I can't even remember. I've probably got four slides to go. That's okay. Yep, you okay. can go. Yep, that's fine. Okay, thanks, Linda. Um, so this is the chart for the Scorpio full moon at 17 degrees of... Um, Scorpio Taurus. Um, for me, the Scorpio Taurus polarity is like the life and death kind of um, human limits. Um, although it's a cycle, as we know through the Pluto experience, that it's like a life death rebirth experience like it's truly that more of a trinity um but in terms of that gemini 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 kind of experience of the duality and the polarity and the 
discernment and actually splitting things into two, we can look at life and death as the two poles stretching us in a way. Um, we, as we exist now, are somewhere on that spectrum and we don't know where. Um, and that is an important part of what's going on now as we look at the, with reverence, the death that's going on in the world um, in, in a very extreme Scorpio kind of a way we're faced with death on a large scale and um, that may come to touch us all in a personal sense and that is a very humbling kind of experience a kind you know um, re realization to come to and a very important one as human beings I am um, so it's yeah it makes me think about the death drive the um, god of death Thanatos who is the um, son of the goddess of night Nyx and in some versions of the story also Erebus the god of darkness um, but often just the just born of the goddess of night Nyx um, and uh, Freud talked a lot about the death drive as opposed to Eros um, and the sexual instinct that is sublimated into creativity um, Freud had a Taurus son and a Gemini moon and he of course pioneered the talking cure um, I just thought I'd mention that but um yeah I death is a piece of this time that we're living and death is always actually a piece that we need to allow for and consider and um, it, remo it brought me to this quote from this Carlos Castaneda um, book a separate reality I don't know if you can hear this. it's a very old well-thumbed book um, I perhaps don't have time to read through it, but I might post it. I might post the, the piece at, a, at another time, um, like write it out and share it because it's very, it's very rich. Essentially, what he's talking about is the final line in it. They're being followed in a car um, by headlights in the distance, and the the crux of the matter is that. Don Juan, who is the Mexican shaman, the elder, the Native American shaman, um, says to his apprentice, um, death never stops, sometimes it turns off its lights. So it's just that awareness that death is always with us, actually, and um, being reminding ourselves of that on occasion is an important part of what it is to be human in the sense that it makes us, it brings us, reminds us of what we, of life's value and what we value. And in times of crisis, we can actually look at what our priorities are and understand what we need to do with a lot more clarity than we can, you know, in more, in the good times, in the more indulgent kind of times of, you know, plenty when we're in times of crisis we are forced to sort of look at things with a bit more satin a bit more seriousness a bit more humility and awe and yeah we are humbled is the point so yeah that um it's just for me the scorpio full moon so of course, um, the Sun, Mercury, Kazemi is separating um, by that point, and the ruler, rulers of the co-rulers of Scorpio um, being Pluto at 24 Capricorn and retrograde, and Mars at 26 Aquarius, um, and Venus ruling the Sun from 21 degrees Gemini with Vesta and Hygieia close by 18 Gemini. So the ongoing themes of those things, the health and healing and the focus and sacred attending those sacred fires again it remains relevant um this yeah and the sun and mercury and the moon are all again in flowing aspect to neptune 
having just moved into the 20th degree of Pisces, um, which is, that that occurs tomorrow as well, um, the third deacon of Pisces, which is ruled by Mars. So that could be a really um, significant shift in a lot of ways in that we've had our first, um, Neptune will retrograde back to the second deacon of Pisces, which is ruled by Jupiter. And the first is first decan is ruled by Saturn. Um, so this third instalment of Neptune through Pisces is ruled by Mars, and perhaps that is a perhaps that will be a significant shift um, that we can witness and observe how that will unfold. Um, and just to recall the Scorpio new moon, which occurred in um, October last year, 2019, was opposite to Uranus at four degrees of Taurus. Um, so that is an interesting reflection as well, to look back upon that you know, six months ago, what, what was going on for us. Okay. Finally, the Venus retrograde in Gemini, um, which begins on the 13th of May and runs through until the 25th of June, um, from 21 degrees of Gemini to 5 Gemini. So the station retrograde occurs conjunct Vesta and Hygieia and widely the North Node, having just moved into Gemini, and square to Neptune, which is at 20 of Pisces. So um, those themes that the Neptune piece is significant um, as well. There is going to be a square with Mars in June and Ceres as well in June. So um, all of those squares occur in Gemini season. So um, that will be talked about more then, but it, it's good to be aware of them as we enter into this Venus retrograde time and um, being a time of reflection to some extent, we, to me, it points to the cultivation of our connections. So that includes our outer world connections with friends and family, loved ones, and making the effort to maintain and strengthen those and cultivate those connections, but as well the inner connections that I mentioned before with our brain pathways and where we go with our thoughts and what we indulge in, um, perhaps in relation to the Jupiter rulership of the Sagittarius, although Jupiter in Capricorn is not particularly abundant, indulgent, um, but <clears throat> Perhaps it could be looked at as 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 that, but yeah, um, just keeping that in mind that sometimes we get a little bit stuck in our assumptions and the values, and and therefore when we have that frog in the well, limited attitude, limited perspective, and then the attitude that goes with that, that perceives things in just such a manner that's very just so and then we express ourselves out of that place and it can be quite limited and limiting and we put it on other people um, as though our perspective were the only perspective and um, therefore minimizing the perspectives of others and not making room for the experiences and perspectives of others um, certainly Venus in Gemini for me feels like that that dynamic of speaking and listening and actually engaging with listening as a participatory, you know, like active listening, like really hearing what other people have to say about their own experience. Um, the Venus Kazemi, the Venus star point um, actually is on the 4th of June in Gemini season as well, of course. Um, and so there's more to be said about that, but at a later time. So in closing, in like summary, what I wanted to leave you all with was um, a few things. To take the time to appreciate the simple joys of sensual human experience, 
through the body, through Taurus, um, in all that, that entails, like food and drink and sex and, um, you know, movement um, and music and singing and speech and especially like the speech of the Gemini, Venus and Gemini piece, but never forgetting the listening part, of course. Um, yeah, that we are sensual creatures and we often don't allow time to honour that. Um, considering all our assumptions, the nature of our reality and our values, having taken time to reflect upon those things, being open to broadening our experience, especially amidst these seemingly limited, limiting times. So even though we might feel very limited, it's, it's a lot to do with our mental space in terms of Gemini. And um, as Mercury is moving so fast through the signs from Aries, you know, today with the dark moon in Aries, Mercury is there approaching the sun. Um, and so what can we glean from that? And then, you know, noting that um, Mercury will go pass through Taurus and then be in mutual reception with Venus and then going on to Gemini and joining in with that whole um, Gemini thing, which of course then leads us into Gemini season itself. So just the open-minded curiosity and um, having that curiosity about our own experience and what that really is trying to lead us to and what we're what we can learn from it um, and then as well being curious about other people's experiences and what they have to bring to us um, and finally cultivating the awareness of the rhythm of our own breath because the breath <coughs> excuse me is truly the ethereal anchor to which life is inextricably bound and when the breath is gone the life is gone and we are left with thanatos and um, we're taken to the underworld and um, who knows oblivion and the unknown and so i'm honoring that that rhythm of our breath and just sitting with that as often as we can remember to this is an absolutely beautiful image. It uh, is very poignant um, by George Frederick Watts. And the proverb, the Irish proverb, a false sense of security is the only kind there is, which really says it all. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for coming. Thank you very much, Zoe. That was great. Thanks, Linda. Yeah, okay. I'm just going to unmute everyone now. Would you all please thank Zoe Shuttleworth? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Zoe. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you, Zoe. Thank you all. <laughs> Thanks, Sue. Thank you, Zoe. Thanks very much, everybody.